Now I am going to move to uh, audit reporting. I'm going to move to the, the back end of the exam, to the back end of the paper. Typically audit reporting is uh, the subject of question five. Uh, question five is very much always towards the end of an audit and um, it's quite common for it to be uh, audit reporting, the audit report itself that gets examined. Um, the question I'm going to do is a question called MSV. MSV. And looking at my uh, revision kit just there, it's, uh, I can see that it was examined in June 2007. And it's a, it's a lovely question with a bit of, uh, bit of memory test and um, a lot of scenario-based analysis. It's a really good question. Um, where you extract your question from, as I've mentioned before, is up to you. You can get it from the uh, ACCA website, or you can get it from, I believe you can get it from this website, and you can certainly also get it from a revision kit. Um, I've got mine from my revision kit, and mine's just down here on the left. Um, what do I need to say about audit reporting before we start the question? I don't think I need to say anything, so here we go. Let's start our revision on audit reporting with the question MSV. I think before I write anything, I should have a look at the requirements and whatnot. Um, a, um, ISA 700 blah de blah de blah, um, required list the six basic elements of the audit report, and B, scenario, 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 uh, required uh, for each of the above, list audit procedures, and assuming that you've done all you can, what would be the effect on the audit report? Uh, it's an absolute classic. Um, perhaps the marking allocation could do with being a bit clearer, but it is what it is. I don't think I need to say anything more, apart from here we go. Here's question MSV. Part A. Um, the mnemonic I tend to go for, for the contents of an audit report, the mnemonic I go for, for the audit report, is um, the rather naff mnemonic uh, boss. Um, <laughs> it's okay, I suppose. But the great thing about uh, boss is uh, boss is that it's just the, uh, you know, the first letter of each of the, uh, the, the things that go into uh, an audit report. Obviously, I'm going to write this down in a second, but I feel like using a highlighter pen, so I'm going to. Uh, you've got A. A is the address, which is, of course, to shareholders. Then you've got I. I is the introduction. You tell the shareholders what you have audited. R is the responsibilities, the respective responsibilities of both the auditor and the directors. B is what's called the basis of opinion. I have, uh, we have conducted this audit in accordance with the International Accounting Standards. I do apologise. International Standards on Auditing. And then O is the opinion, the key, uh, the key paragraph of the audit report. And, of course, what the client is hoping for is an unqualified opinion. And that's when you say that the financial statements do show a true and fair view. And then S at the end is the signature. We sign, of course. It's our audit report, so we as auditors sign. OK, here we go. Let's change to a black pen. A. Address. The audit report is addressed to the shareholders. It is a little bit of a short sentence, but I don't think there's much more you can say of other than, than, than that. Um, uh, I, introduction. I guess it is... <laughs> 
I mean, the main motivator for doing this paper, F8, is so that you can pass your examinations, become a um, uh, qualified ACCA and earn more money. But um, I suspect many of you will be doing this qualification uh, not just to earn more money, but to earn more money by getting involved in accountancy, one would imagine. Um, it's not the only thing you can do with ACCA. You can do lots of things with ACCA, but it's certainly most obvious that it's most useful for accountancy. On that basis, I suppose it wouldn't hurt you to pick one of your favourite companies, go to their websites and just have a look in the shareholders' information at an annual report. And what you'll find when you download that annual report, um, I mean, I, I won't say it's my favourite company, but I just happen to be looking at it uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, it's the company Publicis, which is quoted on the uh, Paris Stock Exchange. And um, like all financial statements, I do apologise, like all annual reports, they come in two bits. There's the front and there's the back. The back of the annual report is the financial statements. The front of the annual report is the glamour, the pictures, the pie charts, the graphs, the analysis. Now that section there often known as the Operating and Financial Review, is completely unaudited by us as auditors. However, the audit report goes into the annual report and unless you tell the shareholders, I don't think they're going to know that we haven't audited the annual report. We don't audit the annual report, we only audit half of the annual report, the financial statements. And the introduction is the paragraph in which you tell the auditors uh, that you've audited the financial statements and also the page numbers. So, for example, if the operating of financial review is on pages 1 to 74, then we will have audited the financial statements on pages 75 to, uh, you know, 168 or whatever. Introduction. This paragraph this paragraph whoops this paragraph tells shareholders that we have only audited the financial statements and gives the page numbers. Uh, this paragraph tells shareholders that we have only audited the financial statements and gives the page numbers. Uh, and like I say, I don't think it would do you any harm to click onto your favourite company website, whether that be uh, Marks and Spencers in the UK or whether that be uh, Real Madrid Football Club in Spain. Uh, click onto that website and have a look at the annual report and you'll see what I mean. Half of it is the glamorous operating and financial review and the back end is the less glamorous financial statements, the somewhat dry financial statements. We only audit that bit, the back. A, I, uh, is it uh, boss is R, isn't it? Respective responsibilities. R, responsibilities. Um, the next paragraph the next paragraph outlines the respective responsibilities
of um, auditor and directors. Uh, that's the uh, the second paragraph, actually, the third point. Uh, a boss basis of opinion. Basis of opinion. Uh, this is the biggest paragraph and uh, very briefly explains how an audit is done. Uh, this is the biggest paragraph and very briefly explains how an audit is done, true enough. And O, the opinion paragraph. Uh, fairly obviously the auditor uses this paragraph to communicate his opinion. on the true and fair view of the financial statements. Uh, fairly obviously the auditor uses this paragraph to communicate his opinion on the true and fair view of the financial statements. And then S, signature. S, signature. Um, at the end, the auditor signs and dates the report signs and dates the report uh, at the end the auditor signs and dates the report in most countries in the world um, the auditor will sign the report uh, using the name of the partnership um, rather than using their own name uh, but in the United States of America you're actually required to you know, sign using your own name. So if I were a partner of PwC, then I would sign Martin Jones, Price Waterhouse Coopers in the US. But if I was uh, signing an audit report in the UK as myself, but working for Price Waterhouse Coopers, I would leave out my name and I would sign Price Waterhouse Coopers. I think the Americans have got that right, haven't they? They've got that right. They're making me take responsibility for my audit report by putting my name on the line. And I think that's correct. The Americans have got that correct. But here in the UK, you can still get away with using the name of the partnership. So let's just check I've got those uh, six in full. So I did A for address, I for introduction, um, R for respective responsibilities, B for basis of opinion, O for opinion, and S for signature. Yeah, that seems to be fine, which brings us to part B. So part B now. Part B, part one. Um, you are the audit manager in charge of 
uh, MSV for the year ended 28th of February 2007. MSV is um, based in a seaside town and hires motorboats and yachts to individuals for amounts of time between one uh, day and one week. The majority of the receipts are in cash with few customers paying by debit card. Consequently, there are no trade receivables on the company's statement of financial position. The main non-current assets are the motorboats and yachts. The company is run by four directors who are also the major shareholders. Total income for the year is about 10 million. The following issues have been identified during the audit issue. Excuse me, issue number one. Audit tests on sales indicate a weak Weakness in the internal control system with the potential understatement in the region of 500,000. The weakness occurred because sales invoices are not sequentially numbered, allowing one of the directors to remove cash sales prior to recording the sales daybook. This was identified during the analytical procedures of sales when the audit senior noted that on the days when this director was working, sales were always lower than in the days when the, uh, when the director was not working. So we have a, a, an, un, an unreported fraud, apparently. Uh, let me just get my head around this one. Uh, audit tests on sales indicate a weakness in the internal control system. So we have sales, but we don't have a system, not a proper one, uh, for recording those sales transactions. Uh, with the potential understatement of income in the region of 500,000, which sounds like a lot. What was the sales? Total income for the year was 10 million. I presume that means sales was 10 million. So it's, um, what's that? That's, uh, uh, is that 5%? Have I said that right? 5 million would be half, wouldn't it? So yeah, it's 5%. So 5% of sales, what's the profit? doesn't say what the profit is. And one would suspect that would probably wipe out the sales. It wouldn't wipe out the sales. It would wipe out the profit. Um, I don't know, it doesn't say, but it would certainly take a big chunk of the profit, uh, this fraud. So, yeah. The weakness occurred because the sales invoices are not sequentially numbered. Why not? It's not difficult. You just buy one of those pre-printed pads and you have sales invoices you know, pre-printed. Anyway, they have a problem. Um, allowing one of the directors to remove cash sales prior to recording the sales daybook, which, you know, when you don't have a system and you don't have segregation of duties especially, um, you know, it does happen. Cash is easy to steal. This was identified during the analytical procedures of sales when the audit senior noted that on days when the director was working, sales were always lower than on the days when the director was not working. Um, list the audit procedures you should conduct to reach a conclusion on these issues. Eight marks. Well, it's eight marks for A1 and A2. Assuming that you've performed all the audit procedures that you can, but still, but the issues are still unresolved, explain any potential effect, if any, on the audit report. Well, you know, I'm not going to say this is the easiest question in the world, because it's not, but should we get a flavour for part two so that we can actually nail part one? Um, it seems to be telling me that there's inadequate recording of sales transactions. It is telling me that there is inadequate recording of um, sales transactions. So, um, if I cannot confirm the actual sales that have been stolen, then there's been a limitation of scope, right? So, if there has been a limitation of scope, then I would be, I would be reporting to the shareholders that there's a except for scope limitation. Do you know what? I think I'll quickly remind you how audit reporting works. So we've got, I'm going to just scribble that out and got just a, uh, just a reminder, reminder, reminder. Do you remember this? The two types of audit reports are, na 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 na, you always show uh, disagreement first. The two types of audit report are disagreement and that occurs when you disagree with the financial statements 
and scope limitation and that occurs when you when you don't know because of the information being insufficient when there is a limitation of scope you get a scope limitation the two levels of significance are material uh, which is big and important and uh, pervasive where it's uh, so big and so important that it renders the financial statements completely meaningless. Um, so if there's a material disagreement, then you say except for disagreement. And if there's a material scope limitation, you say except for limitation. If you have a pervasive disagreement then you just do not think the financial statements show a true and fair view. You think they do not show a true and fair view. So you end up with a, what do they call that, an adverse opinion. Gosh it's a long time since I've thought about this. So it's an adverse opinion and the one everyone remembers. If you have um, absolutely no idea what's going on in the entity because of the lack of information then you just say, I don't know, I don't know and that is called a, a disclaimer <laughs> almost knocked it out of my memory there so working our way backwards if you have a pervasive or fundamental scope limitation and you've no idea what's going on in the company you say that to the shareholders that's called a disclaimer, a disclaimer. If you think that the financial statements are complete rubbish and you totally disagree with them, then you have an adverse opinion. If you disagree with something very specific, very important but very specific, then you say you disagree with that specific thing but the rest is okay, that's except for disagreement. And then if you believe that there is something that you cannot audit that's very specific but the rest of the FS are okay, then you say so. You say, there's a problem with this, I could not audit it, but except for this limitation, the rest of the FS show a true and fair view. So that's the four of them, right? Okay, well, issue number one, from my point of view, uh, I, it looks material to me. It's certainly at least material, but I don't think it's pervasive. It's not like we can't audit any of the, uh, the revenue. It looks like we can audit the revenue, except the revenue on the days when dodgy director comes in. So for me, it appears to be a material scope limitation. So I'm going to suggest that it's a material scope limitation uh, in part two. I'm going to suggest it's a material scope limitation in part two. But the way I'm going to do so is I'm going to get myself three marks. Can you see that? I'm going to say, first of all, it's material, then it's a scope limitation, and then an extra mark for it's a material scope limitation, except for limitation. So I'm going to get myself three marks for the audit reporting. If it's three marks for the audit reporting, it must be five marks for the auditing. And there is auditing here in part one. So issue one requires us to list the audit procedures you would conduct to reach a conclusion on these issues. So we're going to do some audit procedures. So in issue one, I'm going to do AEIOU because I love it. So we've got A, analytical review. I'm going to use A, analytical review. Now, um, analytical review is typically ratios, isn't it? But it's any test that's using your head. So here's my test. I will attempt to measure the extent of the fraud by comparing sales 
on problem days. To sales on normal days. And it might work out something like this. On, um, uh, on a normal day, uh, the sales are um, 40,000 pounds. Does that sound likely? It sounds an awful lot to me. But on the other hand, the total income is 10, 10 million, isn't it? It's a lot of money, isn't it? 10 million for hiring boats and not having a system. And they're paying in cash for these boats, and it, lots of, it doesn't really make sense, does it? The question doesn't sound terribly likely. But in this imaginary world where you can have 10 million of cash transactions for hiring boats, if you could have ca you know, 10 million for cash transactions for hiring boats, I think personally I'd probably rather be a boat hirer than I would be an auditor. And perhaps you're in the wrong career. If this was actually real, come to think of it, if this was actually real, then we're in the wrong careers, aren't we? Well, it's not real. It's a bit naff, isn't it? Um, but in this imaginary world where we're hiring out boats in cash transactions and they are for $10 million sales, then I suppose it is possible to have a you know, sales volume of 50000 um, on a normal day. So if on a normal day you have 50000 but when this director is there on his own, then you have um, uh, 30000 then clearly the difference between 30,000 and 50,000 is 20,000, so it looks like he steals 20,000 every day that he's on his own. And if the number of days he was on his own was 10, then, you know, 10 multiplied by the 20,000 he's nicked gives us 200,000. That's how I'm going to estimate how much we think he's nicked. It's not perfect, but, you know, it's a start. A, E. A, E. An inquiry um, I'm not going to ask the fraudster himself how much he's nicked <laughs> that wouldn't be very subtle I'm going to try something a little bit more subtle um, I will ask the uh, directors the other directors um, are the any reasons why sales uh, volume drops on certain days. And investigate. Because uh, the truth of the matter is there could be a perfectly reasonable reason for uh, the, you know, the story I was saying. It may be that the reason that uh, the sales volume is not 50,000 but instead is 30,000 is because you just don't, you know, you don't, you don't do sales, you don't do hire, hiring of boats on a Thursday. I don't know, that could be the reason. And actually there could be no fraud at all, so we better just, you know, ask around. I will ask the other directors, are there any reasons why the sales volume drops on certain days? Are there any reasons? Any. Are there any reasons why the sales volume drops on certain days? And investigate that. A, E, I, inspection. Inspection. Um, I will inspect the motor boats records for evidence of any use 
um, on days when zero use was recognized in sales. Um, I mean, I don't hire motorboats, so I don't know for sure, but I'm kind of imagining that motorboats might, I'm, yeah, I'm just imagining that motorboats might have like a logbook in them, and in that logbook you would, you know, sort of note your name and what you, where you plan to go, and you might, you know, report to the Coast Guard and, you know, give your um, information to the Coast Guard about your route and that sort of thing. Now, if on Thursday, the 17th of April, all of that is in the motorboat records for a guy called Philip Green, and that Mr. Philip Green clearly did hire the boat for that day, but there is zero use recorded in sales, then obviously, you know, we've got a fraud. We, 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 we're in, aren't we? That, that, would, that would be incontrovertible proof that there is a fraud. So we've done A, E, I, O, observation. Not the best of tests, but we can give it a try. I would observe a business activity at MSV on days when the suspect the director is there on his own. Uh, clearly he's not going to conduct a fraud while we're watching, that would be very, very stupid. But on the other hand, if the normal sales volume is 50,000 and while we're there it's 50,000, but while we're not there it's 30,000, you see where I'm going with that, right? So, uh, you know, observation's not perfect, it has to be said, but if when we observe on a Thursday when he's there on his own, it's just as busy as normal, then there doesn't seem to be anything special about the days when he's there, and no explanation for the dip in the sales volume. Well, that's what I, I would recommend for your O test there. So that's A-E-I-O-U, recomputation. It's possible we could have just got our maths wrong, to be quite frank. So, U, recomputation. I will recompute uh, sales records. On problem days, as it is possible that the problem is simply arithmetic. Maybe he is recording all of the sales, it, it's just he's not very good with a calculator. And the actual number of sales when he's there is actually 50,000 and there's no problem at all. I will recompute sales records on the problem days as it is possible, the problem is simply arithmetic. And there are five tests that I would do in order to help me to get a feel for the, for the problem. But if having done these five tests, I still don't feel I've really nailed this down. I'm still not too sure. Is it a fraud? Isn't it a fraud? Is it a fraud? Isn't it a fraud? I don't know. Whose fault is that? It's their fault. 
not just the fault of the fraudster director, but more importantly, the fault of the other directors. It's their job to have a decent system. And they don't have a decent system, so they have limited my scope. So part B, part two. So that's part two, so yeah, issue. Issue one, should we just make that nice and clear? Part two. Scope limitation. If the above extra tests don't enable me to get to the bottom of this problem, then I have suffered a limitation of cope, scope. If the above tests do not enable me to get to the bottom of this problem then I have suffered a limitation of scope. If the above tests do not enable me to get to the bottom of this problem, then I have suffered a limitation of scope. Uh, material. Uh, the significance of this problem is clearly material. as it is in the order of 5% of uh, sales. So that's, uh, this is the, you know, half a million divided by the 10 million that I was talking about earlier. The 500,000, by the way, compared to the 10 million I was talking about earlier. So the significance of this problem is clearly material as it is in the order of 5% of sales. Uh, so the conclusion is except for limitation. So the resultant audit report would be qualified So the resultant audit report would be qualified sometimes known as modified right brackets modified except for limitation and it's normal to put that into quotes because it's an actual quote from the ISA uh, so the resultant audit report would be qualified except for limitation good okay that's that one now issue number two um, during uh, testing of non-current assets, one yacht was found to be located at the property of one of the directors. The yacht has not been hired out during the year, and inquiries indicate the director makes personal use of it. The yacht is included in non-current assets of the balance sheet of the financial statements. Now, it sounds like um, pr pretty much that one of the directors has nicked one of the yachts. 
Uh, it's not necessarily the case, but it does sound like that. Now, this is not a limitation of scope. Uh, uh, if, as we suspect, uh, he has nicked the yacht, then uh, the yacht is no longer effectively the property of the business. Uh, if it's no longer effectively the property of the business, then it should be excluded from the business balance sheet. But it's included on the business balance sheet. It's included on the business balance sheet, but we think it should be off the business balance sheet. And therefore, we disagree. We disagree with that one line, non-current assets, but we're fine with the rest. So it is a material disagreement leading to accept for disagreement. You see what I'm saying, don't you? Three marks for those three headings for the audit report, report part two. So part two has got three marks, but as you can see, issue two has got six marks, which means that we need to do three tests in order to, uh, to do three tests. So um, I'm going to do three tests to try and get a feel for this. Um, issue two. So number one is the tests. A E I O U. A analytical review. And I will review the age of the yacht as it is possible the yacht is fully impaired rather than stolen. You know, just, just because it can be used by the director doesn't mean that it could be used in the business. Um, I mean, I, I, I have a car, I've got a um, Mazda 6 uh, and I live in London. These videos have been recorded in London. As you might imagine, cars in London look something like cars in Delhi. Uh, they're all bashed, and mine's a particularly bashed up version of a Mazda 6. It's, it, it was formerly a hire car, and there is no way that Hertz could possibly use my vehicle. It would be fully impaired if it was a hire vehicle with Hertz. But for me, I can use it. And that, it, it, that's how what I'm talking about, you see. It, just because, you know, the paint's a bit scratched and uh, maybe the woodwork on the yacht is not quite perfect doesn't mean the director can't get fun out of it. So it's quite possible that he's just, you know, sort of taken the yacht at the end of its life. In which case, it's got an impairment, but, it, you know, it, it, it's not the same as a theft, is it? You see that? A.E. Inquiry I would ask the other directors is the removal of this yacht authorized and inspect board minutes. You know, because if everyone's fine with this, then, you know, it's not really a problem, it's just that the financial statements need to be adjusted and we need to take the fella off the balance sheet. It's not really a problem, it's not like someone's nicking money, like the other one, 
but it is a problem in financial reporting. AEI, inspection. I would inspect the yacht to verify it is the one missing from MSV harbour. You know, I feel almost certain that every time I answer this question I come up with different points. Don't think that because I've put down these points that you couldn't put down different ones. You can, you can do whatever seems to work for you. I'm happy with these, but you might prefer something, I was going to say slightly different, you might prefer something completely different. It's fine. I would inspect the yacht to verify it is the one missing from MSV Harbour. And if having done all that, I confirm that the one missing from MSV Harbour is with the director, it is authorised, but it's also fully impaired, then, you know, it hardly really matters from the point of view of financial reporting. From the point of view of financial reporting, um, it shouldn't be on MSV's balance sheet. It's, it may be, you know, it may be cool from a corporate governance point of view, but it shouldn't be on MSV's balance sheet. If they keep it on MSV's balance sheet, then I would disagree. So here we go. So issue two. Um, disagreement. Oops, I do apologise. Part two. Disagreement. Clearly, if MSV insist on keeping the yacht on MSV balance sheet, then I would disagree with this. Material. Um, well, we don't have a profit to compare to. This is much smaller than the issue one above. But I I still feel this is material as it involves a director. It's up to you though. You, you possibly might argue that it's immaterial. I think it is material but it depends on the convincing, the, convinc the nature of your argument and whether you are convincing or not. This is much smaller than the issue one above but I still feel it's material as it involves a director. So the conclusion would be therefore except for disagreement. Conclusion. Except for disagreement. Oops. It's a bit big, isn't it? There you go. Conclusion, except for disagreement. So the result
would be a qualified opinion except for disagreement. And as I say, this is traditionally represented in quotes, although I'm not sure it's strictly necessary. So the result would be that a qualified would sorry the result would be a qualified opinion except for disagreement. And there we are. There is a fairly typical question five. Harder than some of the other questions, right? It is generally true that questions three and four are easier. And, well, it's certainly been true in the case of this question. When this was examined, this was one of the harder questions on the paper. But not impossible. Okay, well done, guys. That's audit reporting. Audit reporting in the bag.